and, and to having other people try them too. But you're right, let's move on to Dorley now. We, um, and, and let's hear about um, another region. So um, Dorley, if you want to share your screen, that would be super. Yes. I'm, I'm, I was so happy to listen to Michael. It's such a privilege. I could listen to him for always. <laughs> Do you see my screen already? Yes, lovely, perfect, yeah. Perfect. Okay, shall I start? Yeah, please do. And I know you're going to yeah. cover a little bit about Bergenland and about um, as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be able to talk to you today. It's a very special day in Austria because last night uh, restaurants have opened after more than six months of lockdown. So everything has been closed since November 2nd. And actually, my last travel before the first lockdown, which was in March uh, last year, was to Ireland. So this was really my last uh, visit before we all stayed at home for so many months. And so I'm very, very happy to talk to you again, like another celebration moment together with you. Um, my... Um, my history of the winery is uh, a little bit the contrary of Michael's because it is a very short uh, history. And um, I, my family and my and 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 the production is is very very young, and we still have to research and find out uh, the knowledge that Michael and before him 850 years the monks have have been doing so it is quite exciting um, because I learn every year and I realize new things uh, with every harvest and every picking we do and every every day in the vineyards and it's also very exciting to listen to Michael and to and to see what what of that knowledge that he's uh, his winery has and the experiences, what of that is um, valid also for my tiny, tiny project. So everything started um, in, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century when my grandmother who is sitting here on that picture married <laughs> and she for her wedding got as a gift, a tiny vineyard of 0 0.17 hectares on the Spitzerberg which is the place where nowadays all my vineyards are. So it's everything started with an emotional moment. Unfortunately, her husband uh, didn't live for very long. He died when my father was uh, eight weeks old. So he didn't know his father. I didn't know my grandfather, but I knew my grandmother and she was a tough lady because she uh, resisted to all the troubles that um, appeared after that. So, um, Austria, you know that, you have seen that already. The region of Conontum, Michael already told you, it's um, south of the Danube and north of the Leiter, which is a tiny river, which is a bordering line between Lower Austria, Niederösterreich, and Burgenland. So from an Irish perspective, probably this is not very important, but for us, it's very important that we are part of Lower Austria and not of Burgenland. This um, uh, shows you a little bit what the special uh, situation in uh, Canuntum is. Um, we have actually two mountain ranges. One is the Leitergebirge, Leiterberg, which is the beginning of the Alps. And the other one is the Hunsheimerberge, which is the beginning Dorothy, of the Kappa. I, I, I'm yes. just interrupt you just for one second, because I, I can't see the screen if you're sharing it. Do you want to just double check or is it just me? You or can't see anything? Like that? No, I don't, not, not right at the moment. Um, let's see again. We can see you, but we can't see the screen sharing. There we go. That, that's you it. haven't seen anything so far? Uh, no, but we've seen you and we've followed you. So I think we're good. Um, so your grandmother. So you yeah. Have, yeah, yeah, my grandmother. Da, 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 Here da. we are. Here we are. And this is, uh, you see that now? Yep, perfect. Yeah. Like that? Yep, awesome. Good, okay. 
So this is, um, as I said, the Leitergebirge, the beginning of the Alps, and the Hunsheimer Berge, the beginning of the Carpathians, uh, which go down all the way to Romania. And actually, this has been one big mountain range coming from the Pyrenees to the Himalaya, uh, which was created actually when the, um, the African continent kind of popped into the European one and then the Alps were, were folded up. And, and this was an ongoing mountain chain and only, only 20 million years ago, this broke down. And a kind of corridor uh, appeared, which links nowadays the Vienna Basin with the Pannonian uh, Hungarian uh, Basin. And what is very important is that this is a, a quite uh, tiny corridor. And understanding that you have two big mountain ranges going up from here quite high, not in the beginning, but later on, this is really a place where you have a lot, a lot, a lot of wind, of course. And the wind mostly comes from east, uh, southeast, going up, and then usually going west and avoiding the rains coming from Ireland uh, to drop down on the Spitzerberg. <laughs> so we are positioned in a very, very dry uh, region. We have about one, 400 millimeters of rainfall a year. And most of that usually in the, in the beginning of summer. I will show you a slide a little bit later. So this actually, the Spitzerberg is where my vineyards are. And here you see Neusiedlersee, which is the big lake, and Gols, which is the place where um, Gerhard Bittnauer is, um, is located. So we are literally very close. We could, no, it's not about shouting from one place to the other, but we, we drive maybe 25 to 30 minutes from one place to each other. And it looks quite similar, but it is not because what we know, I mean, in temperatures, we are more or less um, uh, the same, um, but the difference is really this big lake, which kind of moderates the climate and also provides humidity. So even if we don't have a lot of rainfall here, neither in Gauls, you always have humidity in the air and the vines can take the humidity from there. And this helps uh, the maturation, which goes a little bit faster there. And usually the wines are, the vines are able to produce a little bit more sugar because you know, they have the humidity that they need for photosynthesis. While here on the Spitzerberg, where we are so wind exposed, um, and we don't have any influence, interestingly enough, of the lake anymore. Um, it's really very, very dry. We have a lack of um, rainfall, uh, usually from the beginning of July until the beginning of September. It is so dry that the vines just stop um, working. You can see that they kind of let, um, um, let down their leaves. And only in, uh, in autumn, when we have the first humid nights, um, the whole system of the vines get in function again, and then uh, they start uh, producing sugar and going on in maturation. So saying that means um, that probably the difference between the wines around the lake and the wines from Spitzerberg is that um, um, we pick a little bit later, because our tannins get mature only a little bit later, but we usually pick with a little bit less of sugar because of that lack of water. Um, so this is, I think, a rather nice picture to explain that we are between two mountain chains. And uh, here again, a picture of showing a little bit better the Spitzerberg. And um, so here you have, or our vineyard map of the Spitzerberg with some sub vineyards, um, which we are just starting to develop a little bit better. When I started making wine uh, there in 2002, actually, um, nobody of the producers were using the name Spitzerberg on their labels. And uh, so I started a 
a group of producers uh, trying to find out what is uh, the um, the character and the personality of wines growing on the Spitzerberg and then uh, agreeing between us um, that we should use the name of Spitzerberg only for Blaufränkisch and only for the finest selection we have, which is usually made from quite old vineyards and from the higher um, terraces that we have. And uh, so we have been doing really a work of research uh, since then. And, um, and we are very, very proud that in 2017, we were accepted also at the, um, at the Association of Traditionsweingüter and uh, that the Spitzerberg was classified as the Lage. Um, Michael has already explained uh, all the details about it. And so what we are doing now for the next uh, years is to develop even better the, the smaller um, sub vineyards because they are really, really interesting in, um, in style. Um, this is um, of the region of Kanondom, the, uh, the six um, village uh, wines with their, um, with their single vineyard. Um, sites and here we are this is um about temperature um this is just to explain what continental climate means and what's what 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 are the conditions for the vines here the green line that you see is tuscany the blue one is bordeaux and the, the pink one is the, the third very important red wine region of europe it's Canuntum. So you can see that um, we have rather cold uh, temperatures in winter going up very hot in summer. And then like from mid of August, usually we get cold nights. So we have very hot day temperatures, but we get cold nights. So the average temperature that is shown here on that slide goes down quite fast, much faster than in the uh, regions that are closer to the sea. You see again that the water is in um, a moderating um, media for the temperatures. And the next slide I think is very interesting because it shows the rainfall that in the regions, and you know that very, very good from Ireland, close to the sea, you have a lot of rainfall during winter getting drier uh, in summer and then Usually from, um, from uh, September on, um, producers in Tuscany as well as in Bordeaux get a little bit nervous. When will the rain start? Because once they start, they never stop again. While in the continental climate, um, like in, uh, in, uh, in Austria, in Canuntum, but also in the Doru, for example, which Daniel has explained probably last uh, week or two weeks ago, we have um, quite dry winters, uh, but cold, and then getting more and more uh, rainfall, having the peak of rainfall usually, uh, usually in uh, mid of May until the end of June. Michael has shown you that last year it was a little bit different because we had no, no, no rainfall until end of May, and then a lot of rainfall during July, but. Okay, this is an average statistic um, slide, of course. <clears throat> and then usually in a, in a, no, on a normal year, um, the uh, conditions would get <clears throat> drier and drier. And we have a long, long uh, dry autumn. And in uh, combination with the cooler temperatures, the cold nights um, in autumn, that means that our wines are, uh, driven by freshness and um, having a, a quite nice um, aromatic um, compound and are maybe not that bold and not that um, powerful, but more in an elegant, um, light-footed uh, character, which is I think, which is how Austrian red wines should be actually, because you have bold and powerful red wines from many regions in the world. <clears throat> so I think we should focus on that. 
Yeah, this is just to show you that the Spitzeberg, where my vineyards are grown, uh, is very, very dry. So even in spring, when everywhere everything is green and fresh and juicy, we have this um, natural vegetation, which is dry grass, um, like in a steppe area. Um, yeah, the vineyards. And this is a quite nice picture showing the Spitzerberg and its um, terraces. It's big terraces, it's not as steep as in Kampdal, and it's also not as high because our, our vineyards go up to 200, 250 meters only. Um, and uh, yeah, and this is some sub vineyards. For example, this is Ried Roderd, and the, this is the tiny vineyard that my grandmother owned uh, and that my parents um, kept on working. They digged it out in the 70s because um, my family lives in a, in a different place. It was quite um, complicated for them to go back and forward to work at Vineyard. But I was there as a child with them very often and I really loved going up in the mountain. And I thought, this is like a mountain is in the world. I realized only much later that there's really high mountains as well. But for me, coming from the very flat place, uh, this was like the uh, the typical mountain. And so I had very good moments there as a child. And when uh, my parents retired as farmers, they handed on this tiny field to me, which was not planted. So I replanted it in, uh, 2000, in 1996, I think. And uh, just for, just for fun, more or less, uh, because I wanted to have that feeling back uh, owning a vineyard. And only later when I um, I met Dirk Kneeport and I lived in the Doro and I, I wanted to have my own wine as well, I kind of remembered that there was something back home. And so we went there, Dick and I started uh, to do uh, that project on the Spitzeberg together. We started in 2002. And as I said, there was really no interesting wine at the time uh, there. And we, it was just, we just had the suspicion that it could be a great place because it really feels good when you climb up that mountain. And uh, so we started one little vineyard and another and another. We did some experimental plantings also with other varieties because we didn't know really which is best. We knew that there is a lot of Blau Frankish and that it's rather good, but would it really be the best or not? So we did some plantings with Cabernet Blanc and we did some Petit Verdot and some Malbec and some uh, Melo and uh, some Syrah. And uh, we realized with the years that Syrah is really, really good and the others maybe less interesting. And uh, that was the reason why we now um, have about 80-85% uh, of Blau Frankish and the balance being Sierra. And um, uh, yeah, the interesting thing is that it's um, pure limestone because this is where the sea dropped um, uh, the sediments, uh, like it was the shore in the at the at the 20 million years ago so we have pure limestone very dry sandy limestone very wind exposed very tough conditions with a yield of only mm, the maximum of 3000 3500 bottles per hectare so really tiny production but a very very eccentric terroir i would say and this is why after all the experiments we have been doing, um, or now I must say I have been doing because I could buy Dirk's shares in uh, 2019. So now I have all the, uh, um, all the duties on myself. So we have seen that um, with all the experiments that it's really, it would be a waste of every square meter where we would have planted a vine that is not expressing the Spitzeberg terroir. So uh, a varietal that would express itself, you know, like uh, I think Merlot is a varietal like that or the Cabernets are like that. To me is a waste of, um, of 
fantastic soil and fantastic terroir. So I understand the varietal as a, a tool to express the, the place, the sense of place. And this is what it, what it should do. And um, because the, the place of Spitzberg is really exceptional. Um, so maybe I should um, explain a little bit now about uh, the philosophy of Gerhard's, of Gerhard Bittnauer. Is that okay, Barbara, if I move uh, I'm on just, to... I'm conscious of the time. We're, we're coming up to five o'clock and I know that there were some questions, but yeah, I, I do think it would uh, be great yes. because um, we've covered yes. two very different regions. And I think a few words, if people need to leave um, because we, we did indicate it yes. would be an hour, then, then, then please do. This will be recorded so you can catch up with it. Um, but it would be great, I think, to, to say something uh, about Gerhard's wines because um, they're, they're something quite different again. Uh, and a very different yes. approach, as you say. And you know him. Super yes. Well, so I know you'll do. I know him very well. Yes. We met, yeah. uh, I think, first when we were 18 years old, and we were both not in, in wine yet. I was studying languages, and he was just finishing, I think, his agricultural school. And he was quite upset because he had to stay at home. I think his father died quite early so he had to take on the um, um uh, the 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 responsibility for the his for the farm of his family and he was not interested very much gerhard always was a an artist a very creative person a very he's so much into music and i've learned so much about music in his um in his uh, in his house because we spent a lot of you know sunday afternoons there and hearing music and so so he was a great inspiration for me but not for wine but for many other things and um i think that we all were quite um impressed when he decided to make wine in the end really that really to take it over and do it for serious and um and we were like wow that's tough and it's very brave because his passion was on a on maybe on a very different uh side but i think that with the years and with the changes that he has been doing in his winery he kind of found a synthesis of making wine and having his own very creative and very philosophical um approach to the world and if you look on his wines and in his wines nowadays they express ex exactly that they have they are very free and wild and um and liberal and um and they express exactly his personality and his his way he looks to the world and and how he raises his children and he raises his vineyards and everything so i think he did he did a step by step um evolution i think his first thing his he started was um was biodynamic farming um not sure i think it was in the i don't remember exactly when it was sometime some years ago maybe 15 years ago and from there then he also changed his winemaking, so he stopped using selected yeasts after uh, after having changed his farming in the vineyards because <clears throat> he understood that okay it would be a shame to now um, reduce the expression of the grape that he has been growing in the vineyards and then uh, he stopped the uh, temperature control at uh, at vinification and then he stopped uh, using any and uh, adding any sugar. And from there, it was just a tiny, a tiny, a tiny, a, a tiny step to do um, even more, even wilder wines, and going into pet nut and going into natural wines, and and then going into names that are not about grapes and not about uh, not about sense of place, but which are just yeah. Um, concepts of of freedom probably and so i'm i think that in his life and in his winemaking he brought that together so much and and so good and he 
him. He feels now also really, really happy. Maybe not today because he has this surgery. But <laughs> in a total, it's... <laughs> As a wine importer, I have to say, you know, working with you and then working with Gerhard and working with Michael and the other wineries that we work with, you're all, I mean, completely different. That That's the point. Um, you know, you represent different philosophies, different personalities, but you're all people who I would like to share a glass of wine with or, or much more um, as soon as possible. And, um, you know, <laughs> and I do think your personalities come through both your presentations and and through your, your wines, um, if I can say that. And that is not really a cliche. Um, and, and in that sense, I am thanking you for, for, for the insights that you've already given us. There are um, there was one question I know in the chat there that I'd like to pose to um, Michael if he's still there and able to um, come back on on screen. Yeah, there's so there are there are a number of questions. W would it be um, okay if we just kind of go through maybe some of those? I'll take maybe the one in the Q and A, which is a question about the tradition wines and what is their aging potential? Because obviously these wines are already um, significantly aged. Um, what 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 and um, and what would be your view on on that? Um, uh, it's uh, you know asking winemakers about the aging possibilities of the wine is always a pretentious question. You know you the winemakers always flirting you know with the eternal life of the wine. So uh, I'm not not really sure you know um, you know how, how much sense it makes. I think that uh, as as you're all as you're all um, as you're all experts uh, you you. You, you have, uh, I think you have yourself an idea. Um, my, uh, as, as I explained earlier, we, we have a library that's going back to the 40s. And uh, so we have a certain uh, experience about, uh, about the aging curve you know, of, of our wines. And, and I, I think this is one, one of the aspects, you know, when it comes to the wines uh, of Austria, the wines of the, the Danube region, uh, white and red is that uh, that you have uh, that you have the potentials here, you know, for wines uh, that you can age for a really long time, uh, probably much longer than than you know what what when whatever uh, the whatever you know stays uh, in in the possibilities of of, of a restaurant or or whatsoever. Uh, so um, I have uh, I have no doubt, you know, that that also the the, the the Cuvée 50 years is a, is, a, is a wine that you can that you can keep for another 10, 20, 30 years whatsoever. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. I mean, there's still a good percentage of younger vintages in it, so I, I think that makes sense. Sinead, you had, I think, um, do you want to just go yeah. through any other questions? But I, I'm going to indulge us here because it's very rare that I get these two people in the room. We are going to go on and we are going to pose some more questions. And if you have any, please put them in the chat. Uh, but if you need to leave, because I appreciate your time is precious, then do that as well. It is recorded. OK. Um, a question for Dirty. I think this is a really nice lead on to your lovely talk about Gerhardt. Um, do producers who opt out of the DAC system whose wines don't qualify, do they undermine the DAC system? Because I know that Gerhardt does opt out. <laughs> Uh, that's a that's a, a tricky question. Um, I think that the DAC system in Austria is still in a process, and um, some regions probably have done it better than others because it's the region themselves who organize and define what they stand for, and in some regions probably um, they. Uh, they have to like think, rethink it again, and uh, and and find out and and integrate um, also the the leading producers, which in some cases are is not uh, is not uh, has not been done, and um, there should be, in my opinion, there should be a a there should be space for people who make like wilder wines. Um, because in my opinion, um, DAC means that it's a 
controlled and confirmed that the grapes come from that region and that they express the region. And um, usually the problem, whether they, whether the producers get the, you know, the stamp for the, the, the quality uh, um, control uh, is not in the analytics and it's not in the data and it's not in the uh, origin of the grapes, but it's in the tasting because there is a jury of people tasting every wine and then saying, yes, it is typical for the region or no, it is not. And I think that in, in my opinion, this is a, um, a, a system that we could, um, uh, we could just um, close down because we don't need uh, any other producers or elderly people to taste the wines and confirm whether they're typical for the region or not and uh, whether they are good or not, because this is definitely something that the market decides as well. I think we should get the confirmation that where does the grape come from and is it, is it really from what it says and is it uh, analytically okay? And then the rest, I think, is not, um, uh, we, we don't need this tasting anymore. And if um, one day we, we, um, we succeed, in, uh, in closing that down, I think that many producers such as Gerhard will be able to join the system again. And then I think that it, then it makes really sense. Thank you for that, Jordi. Um, Michael, I have a question here for you. Um, in Ireland, many people are stuck on the entry goods fine, Gruner Veltliner, and they're not trading up to single vineyard. Is that an issue only here, or is this a challenge generally for Gruner Veltliner? And I think anybody who's online still here that's in a, a customer facing role will find the answer to this quite interesting. Well, when it uh, when it uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to that question, I think then we, we have to consider uh, one aspect. Um, I think I tried to explain that uh, we, are, we are trying to, to, to focus on, on, the, on the wines of Appalachian, so the, the classical expressions of, of our area. And uh, I think one of the, the major impacts of an Appalachian system uh, is not to put a great variety in the focus of your attention, but to, to put uh, the expression, the typical expression of an origin, you know, in, 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 the, in the center. And um, so uh, the, uh, our, our principal idea is that uh, to, to get a collective idea about a term of origin, I think this is something that is very important in, in the whole development of an appellation system. And uh, and uh, to uh, to uh, not to focus anymore so much on great variety, and on the question what is Grunewaldina. I think that uh, when it comes to the development in Austria, we are trying to uh, you know to to overcome the the question of great variety. We as a producer, you know, you have you have different options, you know, to focus on different aspects in a wine. Uh, so that means that uh, if I'm producing a wine, I, I have the option to focus on the quality uh, of a grape. So that means uh, what ca characteristics, what kind of personality uh, does Grunewaldliner, does Chardonnay, does Merlot, does Blaufränkisch uh, is offering. And uh, this is a, is, is a concept, you know, that, that works perfectly well, you know, on, uh, on a certain level of, of entry, entry wine drinking. But at the moment, uh, when you are self digging yourself more into details uh, about the expression, about areas, about the structures of areas, about geology and, and climatical uh, conditions, you know, the, the expression of an area becomes more and more important. And this is the reason, and th this is the, the, the primary focus in an Appalachian system is not to, uh, not to say, okay, I'm producing now a Grüner Veltliner, 
that is grown in the Kamtal area. Uh, the focus is I'm producing Kamtal that is represented by Grüner Veltliner. And the difference is, and this is something that you can that you can play in, in, in all appellation systems in the world, no matter if it's Burgundy or Austria or Italy or wherever. Um, you can take, as an example, you can take uh, a Claude de Bougeau. Um, we, we, we talked about it earlier. Um, if you have a bottle of Claude de Bougeau, you, you can pose the question, what is this wine? Is this wine a Pinot Noir that is grown in the Claude de Bougeau vineyard? Or is this wine a Claude de Bougeau that is today represented by Pinot Noir. And I think that as a producer, you know, we, we are somehow are also uh, in our labeling and in the, in the naming of our wines, we are already are, uh, are signifying, you know, what kind of general philosophy we are putting behind the wine. And uh, if we say, OK, this is a Claude de Bougeot, then we are posing the question, what characteristics and what is the basement of Claude de Bougeot? You know, what, what, what characterizes, you know, the Claude de Bougeot vineyard? You know, what kind of... And it's fantastic, you know, to listen to French uh, colleagues, you know, when they're talking about the differences between Claude de Bougeot or Jam or whatsoever, you know, because they can, they can, they can uh, really characterize, you know, what, what kind of personality these vineyards are about. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's not about uh, the, the, the great variety anymore. It's about more than that. And this is what an appellation system is, is, is all about and, and also in our area. And uh, for everyone who has, uh, has uh, been looking to, to Schloss Gobelsberg, Single Vineyard, Riedland, for example, there is no grape variety anymore. Because what I want to say with this is that it is what, 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 I'm, what I'm bottling here in this wine is what characteristic is Reed Lam about? What characteristic is Reed Heiligenstein? You know, and this is this is much more you know in 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 the focus of my attention. The cultural background, the historical background that is represented in this name, because grape variety is changing. Uh, Two hundred years ago, uh, on Heiligenstein and on Lamb, we had uh, we had field blend. Uh, today it is Riesling and Grunewaldina. In 100 years it will be a different grape variety, but it will st always re remain as Heiligenstein and Lamb. You know? And this, this is, I think, this is the, the really important thing about a, an appellation system and, and what, what is also, you know, in the development also in Austria. In 100 years it might be a red wine grape variety, probably, to, to reply already to the, to the, to the question. No? Because we know that global change. Yeah, yeah there, there was just a question in um, Durley and Michael have probably seen it. So it just says with climate change becoming more and more problematic, do you think there will be an opportunity for Austrian wine industry to explore production of red wine in particular north of the Danube? But you kind of touched on on that already. Um, yeah, sorry. It, in, in fact, it, it is a complicated question. You know, I, I really have to say and and uh, probably, you know, if I'm going to dig myself now into this question, you know, <laughs> it's going to last for a half year, uh, a half, half an hour. But the, the thing, the complicated thing is that what, what is climate and what is climate change? You know, uh, climate change is, um, uh, is a quite statistical value. And, uh, you know, I think that we, we have to differentiate between, uh, between statistical values on one side and uh, the reality of a winemaker on the other side. Uh, and th there's a big difference, you know, between that. Um, in general, in general, you know, th there is, we, we can, we as winemakers, we can prove there's climate change. Uh, so very easily because, uh, you know, if you put on a, on a, on a graph the, the flowering dates of the past 50 years, uh, then you, you can see that, you know, you have early, middle and late flowering. And this is now changing now over the years, going up and down, going up and down, you know, like a, like a curve. Um, now you can, you can, you can calculate a, a, a statistical tendency line through all this data. And you clearly see that uh, the flowering is getting, by the tendency line is getting earlier, which is the, a clear indication of global warming. Um, the question is, what is the significance for us? Uh, because the thing is that, you know, our reality is that we're living in the moment. 
Um, that means that you know, whenever we have an early flowering, we have to react that we have an early flowering, and if we have late flowering, we have to react that it's a late flower. And uh, uh, and uh, so, what I want to say uh, that our reality as winemakers is 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 that uh, that we we are living in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a tunnel that you know that goes not beyond about two weeks because we cannot see beyond this. If it's raining, you know, then we have to wreck, you know, that we, that we have a lot of water. And if there is no water and if there's dry stress, you know, we have to react, you know, that there's dry stress, but we don't know what's going to happen in two or three or four weeks. And this is this is the complicated thing, you know, about, about being a winemaker, you know, on, on one side, you know, we have to develop a long-term thinking, uh, you know, whenever we, we, we are planting a vineyard and we're taking this decision for a great variety, you know, we, we, we take it a decision that lasts for the next 30 to 50 or 60 years. And uh, on the other side, we, whatever we do in the vineyards um, with, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, soil management, everything that we're doing, all the decisions we're doing, it's a very short term uh, consideration and short term decision making. And uh, I think that I, I think that it's very hard to predict, you know, how climate Will develop in, in the next uh, few in the next few decades, uh, and uh, uh, I have to say for our area because uh, Dolly said maybe we will be red wine area. Uh, I'm a little bit skeptical about that because uh, you know uh, the Danube area you know is always working to wine making limits. Uh, so you know the, the more you go up in a valley, uh, the more you gain in altitude, and the more you gain in altitude, the cooler it gets until you reach the limit of wine making. So the result is, you know, when we are, you know, when it's getting warmer, then the, the winemaking zone will develop more to the north. But we will always work, you know, towards the limit. So we will always work, you know, towards the cooler end. Uh, so this is why I'm rather predicting that the area, or let's say at least our area, will at least for the next uh, 20, 30 years, will remain as a white wine growing area. Dolly, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Uh, I think you, you muted. No, I just have a longer perspective than 20 to 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, you know, I could keep going, but I, I do think we better wrap it up there. I, I know you probably have other appointments that you have to go to. And so it's going to fall to me to just thank you um, both very briefly for, um, coming on today and 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 sharing your knowledge and and your thoughts and and what's happening. I mean, you know, personally, Austria on our portfolio, it is genuinely, and I don't say this to everybody, it is genuinely uh, one of the most exciting and the most interesting um, parts of it. Um, and it's particularly so this year. We've put a lot of effort into it, into developing it and extending it. Um, and you know, if you are interested in tasting um, some wines, the palettes have thankfully arrived today. Bottles will be open tomorrow. They will be open early next week. So get in touch with Ben or Gareth about that. Uh, there is also another webinar that I have to mention for next week, which is on South Africa and on California, where we're looking at uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir at the edges in marginal uh, climates and production. Um, I hope it's as exciting as this seminar is. And um, uh, just, I'm gonna thank everyone for staying with us. Um, pretty much everyone did. And, and, and thanks for being here, okay? And see you soon, I hope. Okay. Thank you so much, Bobby. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for organizing and setting it up and thank you for joining. Okay, see you soon, bye.